Yeah, hi. So I'm Liz Taylor from the Exeter Drama Company. Um, and I'm here because myself and my husband, Jack Harding, are directing a comedy double bill in September. And uh, Phonic FM have very, very kindly had me on this morning to, to help me say a little bit about it. So it's described as an evening with mm-hmm. two playwrights. Yes. So is the sort of background about the playwrights other than the two plays? No, so we really struggled on how to name it because it's a comedy double bill um, and the names are quite long. So we thought if we focus on the playwrights themselves because they're quite well known and they're very, very respected, that might be a better way to bring people in rather than just the names of the plays themselves. But it is just the plays that yes. on, on the evening. <laughs> yes, it is just the plays. So how did you decide on those two plays? Or was it just a compromise of some kind? Or what was the background to it? Well, so my husband loves The Real Inspector Hound. He's been in uh, a few productions of it. Um, he has a long history of doing amateur dramatics. So he has always wanted to direct The Real Inspector Hound. Um, and... I was a little bit unsure, but I read it and I was absolutely blown away. I think it's a remarkable piece of writing. So then the issue was finding another comedy one act to go alongside it because The Real Inspector Hound is actually quite short. Um, It's not a three act, five act play. It is just the one act within itself. So we needed to find something to accompany it. So I went away and I read quite a few things and I settled on Porcelain and Pink by F. Scott Fitzgerald because I love Fitzgerald. So it seemed to match quite nicely. So that's the one that you're directing? We're both both co-directing both. both Yeah, yeah, we're both co-directing both. Right. So the the Porcelain and Pink... Mm -hmm. It started as a short story, I think I'm right, or it was, was in a magazine. So it was, it was, or was it, had, do you think it's always been intended as a, as a play? I don't think that it has, to be honest. If you read the script, it's very obvious that Fitzgerald is a novelist. He does a lot of really heavy descriptions, um, lots of long stage directions. Um, so it would make sense if if it wasn't intended to be a play. It is also quite short for a play too, so that's why that one's going first and then Real Inspector Hound is following. So have you had to re- rewrite it at all, select which, which words you're using? Uh, not particularly. I think there's one or two words that we might have had to change in either of the plays um, just because in in Porcelain and Pink something might have been outdated so in Porcelain and Pink uh, the story follows a young girl who stays in the bathtub for the entire play on stage it's a case of mistaken identity it's very witty, very funny but a few times she has to sing songs and those songs aren't really known anymore so we've had to pick things that might be a little bit more popular um not necessarily modern but things that the audience might know because it was intended as songs that the audience would know so it was not not in 20s yes yes very very jazz age very jazz age so which sort of songs i mean this is this is interesting because phonics mostly (laughs) music yes and um the presenters, well, speaking for myself anyway, we, we, we have to think about what a modern audience is uh, going to want to listen to. So this is interesting. What were, what were the original songs and the songs you thought that wouldn't be familiar to Um I honestly couldn't tell you. Um, I've, I've completely forgotten their names, but it, it, was, it was quite old-timey. It was things that rhyme, um, very rhyming couplets and... Um, very jokey, flirtatious, kind of jazzy music. Um, but there, there's no music accompanying it, so it's all the actress on stage singing. So we wanted to give her something that she could also sing along to that she knew quite well. So we're thinking of potentially picking something like um, Come Fly With Me by Sinatra, something yeah. that people will know and that the actress will feel quite comfortable singing along to. Right. And that's... But that's interesting because what what sort of time do, do you think the audience need to need to think they're in the nineteen twenties or the fifties or 
whenever they think Sinatra was... Yeah, that's was... interesting. Um, I don't think so. I think the play does lend itself very nicely to what, whatever decade or era that you'd want to put it in. There's nothing in there that really is stuck in the 20s. It's a case of uh, mistaken identity. It's about the relationship between a younger sister and an older sister who bicker. I think there's a lot of quite universal themes. We can all relate to a younger sibling or an older sibling that's just really annoyed us. Uh, I think that's what's beautiful about the play. There's themes in it that go across all eras. So I don't think that we would need to be firmly in the 1920s for it to work. Okay, so the audience can can make their own mind up about when when it is. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I mean, as I said, the main character spends the entire time in the bathtub, um, and apart from that, there's only two other characters. So things like costuming, that's not as difficult. And it's set in a bathroom the entire time, so in terms of set building, if we want to put it into a single era, again, it's not as difficult because we've only got the one set, and we, we only need to costume two people. So it's not right. that difficult to put it into an era itself. Right. So you, you, you're you using the, just one stage for both productions. So the, 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 the bathroom is removed, presumably. Yes, yes, in yeah. For, in time for the... So we'll remove the big tub. <laughs> We've right. had to source a tub. A very kind gentleman on a Facebook page was giving a bathtub away for free, so that was very lucky. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, that would have been very tricky. Um, and then all we'll change is the backdrops and then move the furniture on for the real Inspector Hound. Because the real Inspector Hound doesn't require any set changes, really, so... That will be quite nice, quite easy, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Right, so tell, tell me more about that one then. The Real Inspector the, Hound. The Real Inspector Hound. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, so the play follows two play critics, and they're going to sit slightly off stage. Um, and the two play critics have come to see a murder mystery whodunit play. It's very cheesy, very hammed up, and one of the critics is quite enjoying it, and then one of the critics thinks it's a bit too cheesy and a bit too typical. However, things within the play start to go wrong, and they get embroiled into the play's mystery. It turns into a play within a play situation, and there's hidden identities, there's mysteries. Uh, it's very, very good. It's very clever, very well thought out, and all of the cast are absolutely blown away by the writing of Stoppard. I think he's absolutely brilliant as a playwright. He was the one that wrote um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, which I think is probably his most famous play. But he's an absolutely brilliant playwright, and hopefully we'll be able to bring that to life. Well, that, that, that sounds, sounds really good. You've got you've got two two samples. Absolutely, yes. So I'm going to line line one of them one of them up now. This is this clip is called Radio Hound. So shall I just play it? First Absolutely, and then you, go you, for you, it. You yeah. No, no. I'm sorry. That's not that one's not. Not, not going, not going. No, don't worry about it. Play. Should we try the other one? Um, yeah, you, ju you if you just talk and mm -hmm. explain. Absolutely. What so the second clip is a conversation between Lady Cynthia, our beautiful and charismatic lady of Muldoon Manor, and the Inspector Hound. Once they discover that a murder has happened in Muldoon Manor and they need to team up together to figure out who did it and why. This case is becoming an utter shambles. But what are we going to do? Okay. I'll phone the police. But you are the police. Oh, thank God I'm here. The lines have been cut. You mean? Yes. We are on our own. Cut off from the world and in grave danger. You, so just just to explain a little bit of the, in the studio, you you won't have heard that, but it did work. That that that, that <laughs> one. Okay, it, good. It, it's just because we got the microphones up, I should have put them down. Blah blah blah. Um, so yeah, this so this is what you were saying. So this is a classic 
murder mystery mm. deserted house situation but they've made it it's deliberately very very cheesy because the play itself the play within a play isn't supposed to be very highbrow very complicated it's got very stereotypical characters we've got an inspector who is a kind of larger than life booming voice kind of um, almost silly character that comes in. We've got Lady Cynthia, who is the beautiful lady of the manor, and she's a widow, and there's different men vying for her attention. We've got the younger girl, Felicity, who is quite charming, but also very suspicious of a new person that turns up at the manor. And we've got older Major Magnus Muldoon, who is a booming Scotsman, um, who is also vying for Lady Cynthia's attention. So there's different levels going on. And then outside of that, we've got two critics watching the play and critiquing what's going on. And they've got their own issues that they're talking about as colleagues who work together. So there's lots and lots of levels and it's absolutely brilliant. And the cast have done an absolutely phenomenal job with the characters. Every single rehearsal, we are in stitches. It's so, so, so funny. And I honestly can't wait for people to see it. So do you think the people who come will have seen it before or know about it? Um, I think a few people might have seen the real Inspector Hound before. The Fitzgerald one is a little bit less known. I mean, Fitzgerald isn't known to be a playwright anyway. So, well, no. Yeah. I, that, that's that. Well, that's that's why I thought of it. Uh, I, I'm just. I just had a quick look in Wikipedia. This yeah. is this is the basis of my knowledge. <laughs> I mean, me too, to be fair. Um, and they, 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 they say it was it originally in a, a collection of, of short stories or, or originally in magazines, but it was published with others about the Jazz Age, as mm-hmm. you were saying, mm-hmm. uh, just, as, uh, uh, just to be read off the page. Mm. Yeah, I see it. I see um, it. But, uh, but I'm sure it does work as a, as a play. It does work. It has work. been produced as a play. Yeah, I'm sure that it has. I haven't been able to find any of the any big productions. Um, not that we're a big production. <laughs> I haven't been able to find any big productions. Um, so I don't think people will know that one. It relies very heavily on the lead actress and um, her bond between her and her sister because the lead actress is on stage the whole time in a bathtub. So she can't really act physically. Um, There's not really any props for her to work with. She can't move around. It's all her. But um, Carmel does an absolutely fantastic job. Um, And we've cast it really, really well. She's very, very captivating as the lead lady. So, But I know I don't think people will know that play. So I'm hoping to introduce people to something new. But in terms of the real Inspector Hound, mm-hmm. it, it, with a with a with a normal who done it, we'd be asked in promoting it not to reveal the well, yes. the last twenty five percent of it. Well, yes. And would you say the same for this one? Oh, I would say that don't reveal the last fifty percent because things change very very quickly. There's Uh, a plot twisty moment that happens about halfway through in which um, one of the critics gets involved in the play. I won't give away any more than that. And the twist at the very end for who the killer is is absolutely phenomenal and nobody will see it coming. I didn't see it coming when I read it. The cast didn't see it coming when they read it and it really comes as a surprise but it's it's very brilliantly done and I think we've cast that person very very well so keep an eye out for that so this is this is quite um I'm having to rethink what I, what I'm gonna do because um, <laughs> I the most most of the drama show previously has been has been on YouTube we put little clips on YouTube yeah um, and uh, uh, my idea is to sort of try to go towards the way the music people promote concerts, events and so forth but with theatre, with live performance but from what you're saying it's maybe you shouldn't you shouldn't um, no, I've got to start again how I explain this obviously a band is not just going to play their greatest hits so that the audience get the same tunes they already know, mm-hmm. they'll try and introduce some new ideas mm. but in general if everybody knows 
the the lyrics to the songs. <laughs> it's it does it doesn't matter. So ra- radio can play singles or album tracks uh, ahead of a live performance, mm-hmm. and that, that works okay. But in terms of theatre, it it's quite an open question how much of a sample you give. When I mean, you've 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 brought one quite short sound clip, which gives gives the atmosphere of the the main play, let's say. But you're more or less saying the subplay should remain a mystery. Yes, I think so. I mean, it's it's a very difficult topic, isn't it? Because music, if you're promoting music and playing songs uh, like for free over the radio or YouTube or something, there's not twists and they're also quite short pieces of media. So I think some plays you could very happily put half the thing or the whole thing for free somewhere to listen to or to watch and you would still have an amazing experience watching it on stage like um for example hamilton the musical that's available on disney plus i've watched it many times but it still didn't quite compare to seeing it live because of the buzz and actually being there in the room with the actors but if a play has twists and secrets I would be very tempted to actually keep that private. I think the enjoyment of that is better if you don't know what's coming. It's like a book. If a book has a plot twist in it, if you're reading a thriller or a horror or a mystery, it's. I think it's better not to know. What do you think? Well, yeah, I think I can see. I can see the 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 the, the strength of that argument in this case. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very diplomatic answer. Well, but because I've already tweeted a link to a, a YouTube uh, version of, of the Real Inspector Hound, mm-hmm. so which I thought would just give people an idea of what to expect. Well, I think that's but, a great idea. But maybe we should tell them only watch first. I think it's about an hour. Mm-hmm. So what we're saying is that it might be better to watch twenty minutes. Yeah. If they're making their mind up whether to, to come to long down or not. Absolutely. Yeah. First fifteen, but not twenty watch, minutes. Not watch any more than that. They can if they want to, but my recommendation as director would be to let you enjoy it for yourself when you see it live. Because it's the twists are brilliant. I think people can watch it if they want to. It depends. Some people are really fussy about spoilers, aren't they? Like my husband, the co-director, won't even watch trailers for films. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I know. It's really frustrating. <laughs> um, whereas I, so I like... So what, what's, what's his thought, thought about that, then? He doesn't want to be ruined whatsoever. I think the the source of this comes from... Um, was it the Star Wars The Phantom Menace um, when Darth Maul's lightsaber was revealed that it had two ends and that was that was a big deal and they, they revealed that in the trailer and he watched that as a kid and now ever since he refuses to watch trailers because he got really upset that they revealed something so cool in the trailer that should have stayed in the film and he, he now <laughs> stubbornly refuses to watch any trailer he won't read reviews about anything before he goes to see it he will just see the thing so there's lots of there's lots of classic drama that he must mm-hmm. have seen before and will he go and see it again with another version of it yes he'll go and see it again um especially if we're talking theater or if there's things being remade into films or tv shows he will definitely go and watch it again just to see how different the current version is but he knows that he already knows exactly what's going to happen in the story so i think his enjoyment is definitely lessened by that but i think a lot of theater goers if you're going to the theater unless you're seeing something new i don't think people mind i mean people know what's going to happen when they go and see a shakespeare play we know if you go and see romeo and juliet you know but the enjoyment is actually seeing the actors on stage and being in the room with that with the performance itself i think Right, but in the, in this case, we're gonna we're gonna say it's better if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I think so. In this particular case, um, I mean, feel free if you're not if you're somebody that doesn't mind spoilers, feel free. 
Um, but if you in any way mind spoilers or knowing what's going to happen, I would just recommend like the first 15, 20 minutes and then leave it there and wait and find out for yourself. Right. Well, just going back a bit to Porcelain and Pink and yes. Scott Fitzgerald. Yeah. The, the other thing I found out just looking in Wikipedia was, was that he, at one stage of his career, uh, tried to be a Hollywood scriptwriter but didn't do very well at it. I really? I, I don't know. You, so you haven't come across no, this bit of it? No, I haven't. Um, because I, I... Well, that, that's, that, that was what was written mm. down there. Well, we've got, we got plenty of time because the, the, the performances aren't till the end of September, yes. pretty much. Is so that right? on the 25th of September, we're in Tedburn St Mary Village Hall um, and the 26th to the 28th of September, we're in Longdown Village Hall. So we do have some time. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll try and find out, if you, if you would do the same, just find out a bit more about Scott Fitzgerald as film mm. script writer. Yeah, absolutely. Because if, 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 we're, if we're saying that this, this does work as, as theatre... It but, does, but, yes. But it was also it also worked as a as, as a magazine article or item, and, and as a short story. So it's it's interesting how he thought about when he was writing deliberately for film, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what has happened to those scripts. Film in the twenties and thirties was very different. So I did a I did a film degree, and I actually looked a lot into this period of cinema. Um, scripts would have had to have been very simple, very short, which Porcelain and Pink is. It is simple and it is short. But it does need to be a lot simpler, a lot shorter, a lot more entertaining and dynamic. Um, sound only came into cinema in 1927, so everything that he would have written in the script would have had to have been written on a on, a, on the screen and then uh, the film would have come back in which right. does complicate things yes. massively so he can't use words or dialogue or... no so no, he that's couldn't not, <laughs> not yeah. where he's starting from, no is it? so he couldn't have had massive beautiful sentences because people aren't going to read that everything was quite short and it was very very light on the writing very light on the dialogue precisely for that reason because people didn't want to go to the cinema to watch a film to have to read things it had to have been very physical, very visual, with a few bits of dialogue in it. I say dialogue, you know, in inverted commas, because there wasn't sound. After 1927, things did change, but they were still very much experimenting, I would say, with how it worked, with how dialogue actually worked. Um, so in, in older films... You'd have um, dialogue coaches and accent coaches and people would talk in very specific ways. Um, people would talk in very specific ways um, in silent cinema as well so that you could kind of lip read sometimes. A lot of silent cinema stars really struggled with the transition into sound because some people had it. Anyway, I'm ranting about, no, no, I'm ranting this, about this, sound. But No, this is interesting because I, I, I can't remember when it was, what the date was that he was writing for, mm. for Hollywood, but I'll, I'll try and find out more. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, wouldn't it? Because I can absolutely see why a novelist would struggle to become a scriptwriter, even now a novelist would really struggle to become a scriptwriter because you really have to strip everything back. I think as a novelist, you focus on descriptions um, and feelings and what you necessarily... You, you have to infer things if you read a novel. A script, it's very much you hand people the characters and the dialogue and you let them perform. You let the actors make the inferences for the audience. I think that's how I interpret it. So I think novelists would always really struggle being scriptwriters, let alone in an era where films were much shorter, dialogue had to be much more carefully put in, and even actors struggled to be in films, let alone the people who would write the scripts. So that's very interesting to think about. I do wonder what year he was trying. Hmm. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll find, find out a bit more during September, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. I'm definitely going to go away and research that. I didn't know. 
No, well, I'll, 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 find, I'll try and find some more references and see if we, see if we can find some more there. So how, how does that work with porcelain and pink, then? Do, do you think he's provided more, more, more direction than you would expect from a script? Absolutely. So, OK, so if we printed it out on A4, um, the very first page of the script... Um, about 50% of that page is stage direction and description, which is very unusual. Um, and there's a lot of... You, you very much feel his presence and the way he wants things done. There's a lot of stage directions. There's a lot of descriptions and instructions within the script itself, which is not really how a script works. A script is very much... You have some instruction, some description, and then it's kind of given to you to work with. That one, it's you very much feel his presence. He makes jokes in the stage directions, which you don't you don't do. No. At one point the no. stage directions they describe the main character sitting in the bathtub and um he says something like um pretty girls have throats and not necks. Why is that relevant? Mr. Fitzgerald, it's not, but he's just trying to be witty and funny like he would be as a novelist. But it's a script. Nobody, nobody <laughs> apart from. <laughs> well, yeah, but you see, I'm not sure. I'm not sure he was writing it as a script. I mean, it, it appears to be a script, but I think he was writing it for a magazine mm. to start with. Mm -hmm. the, it definitely seems like loads of the stage directions have been lifted out of prose rather than script. Because he's trying to crack jokes, he's being funny, he has loads of flowery descriptions with lots of beautiful repetition. It's written phenomenally, but as prose, not as stage directions, which is very interesting. Stage directions should be things like, what does the lighting look like? Where's the furniture? Where are the actors? Not... Oh, the colour of the wallpaper is this and this, and it, <laughs> and they bleed into each other, and the colours beautifully contrast each other, mm. and beautiful girls have throats and not necks, and it, it, that's not what stage directions should be. So, I definitely see how he would have just lifted some of that out from an original draft that was supposed to be prose. Yeah, but you, you don't, you don't, you can ignore the stage directions, or you can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> come yeah. up with your own well yeah absolutely I mean we haven't ignored his stage directions in terms of the actual useful instructions he gives you know as in Lois comes in through the door we haven't ignored that because that's handy instructions for us but anything where he's describing things beautifully I mean that's very nice Mr Fitzgerald but how would we ever find that useful or present that visually i don't know no well you, you've got you've you've got to work out how how to do it as a play and and how to do it now and and so there's very, there's various things you're changing like the music for example absolutely although we're trying to keep 99 percent of it the same for both plays because i think they were written that way for a reason and we would like to honor that so it's only things that we think might distract an audience too much. So here and there, I think, in Porcelain and Pink, he uses some words that we just don't use anymore or makes pop culture references that are supposed to be funny at the time and a 1920s or 30s audience would have found absolutely hilarious because it's part of the joke, but it falls very flat for us. So here and there we might have tweaked or taken out just a reference or a word, but otherwise we've kept it very true to true to form. And with the real inspector hand, when when was when was that first produced? What sort of date was that? Oh goodness, much, much, much later. Ooh. I want to say Oh, I don't know. I want to say something like um the seventies or the eighties. I can look it up, but it's much, much later. So actually we've had to do much less cuts to the script because it reads much easier for a current audience. Yes, it was 1968 that The Real Inspector Hound was originally published. 
so it's much more accessible to us as a modern audience we've not had to make any cuts really so do, do you think the, the audience have the, have the same sort of expectations of, of what a play is like what between now and the 70s between, between, yes between now and the 70s I'm not sure I think I think now theatre is much wider. I think there's a lot more freedom with what can be done with it. Um, and when you go, you sort of don't necessarily know what to expect in terms of traditional things that might be done. I think it. I think we use a lot more technology now. We might use a lot more music now than we did before. But I think the expectation of feeling that charge of being in the room with the actors and seeing somebody do their craft I think is very much the same I think that's why theatre is so special and I think that's why it's stayed around for as long as it has is because for hundreds and hundreds of years that feeling of watching somebody act and tell a story has been incredibly special and I think that's the essence of it the expectation of that has certainly stayed the same it's just how it's packaged I think and I think the, the the murder mystery family situation has continued on television yes. so much that the, the the expectation of how those stories work yeah, is I'm, still very strong. Yeah, that's how stereotypes form. Stereotypes and cliches in, in film and TV and theatre if things are around for a really long time. So Stoppard worked a lot of that into the play within a play. He played on stereotypes. He made it very cheesy he made it very uh, it's, there's a few gags in it he made it very fun because the murder mystery trope as itself has been around for such a long time and people enjoy it so much yeah so that that, that part of it you can leave alone and oh yeah absolutely in fact we've made it even more cheesy <laughs> <laughs> we, we've okay. let the actors have fun completely uh, and it's really paid off they're having a really good time you know, the, the only the only part of it I think might 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 be slightly different is the role of the critics. I don't I don't think the theatre critics are quite as strong now as they were in the sixties. No, definitely not. Um, but the two critics, Bird Boot and Moon, are their names. The the actual script writing for them and the character building is so brilliant. Bird Boot and Moon as characters are incredibly powerful. Um, the actors, any actor could play them, but to play them well, I think, takes a lot of skill. So Christian, who plays Bird Boot, and Chris, who plays Moon, which hasn't been confusing at all when we're talking to them, Christian and Chris, um, they do such a brilliant job of bringing them to life. We've To include them in the play I think without them the play can't run without those two characters the play can't run they are absolutely integral they're the two main characters for reasons which will be revealed yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the end of September or, or on YouTube if you choose to uh, watch the whole sample um, but Perhaps I, I perhaps that I think we've explained it enough. Are there, are there other things you'd like to say about it? So I would like to say that um, if people are worried about transport to Longdown or to Tedburn St Mary, to not worry. There's plenty of parking at Longdown Village Hall. We love performing there. There's pasties available in the interval. There's going to be a little raffle if you like. If you like to be a bit of a gambler yourself and like a raffle. Um, tickets are £9 from our website so we're Exeter Drama Company and by buying tickets and coming to our shows you're supporting a lovely lovely group of local people who just really love what they do we don't get paid for this we don't get any money from this whatsoever we do it just for the joy of it and for spending time with each other and it's really really lovely I think Ever since joining, I joined in December, so I'm still very new to the drama company, but ever since joining, I've made so many new friends 
and I've gotten married since then, but a lot of them ended up being invited to the wedding. And it was, it's oh. lovely. It's like a found family. So if you, if you would like to support us and come along, we'd really, really appreciate that. It means a lot to us. I just, I just add that I, I went to see um, hum, humble, humble Boy, um, having, having got involved in the promotion for it. And I, I can just confirm that Long Down is only about 20 minutes out of Exeter. And uh, there is fun, uh, a, a very large car park, which make, all makes very good sense. Um, go, going a little bit off topic, there's, there's quite a lot of controversy about Exeter's parking, how expensive to make it, and um, whether the shops can survive as well as everything else. Um, but we didn't get into all of that. Just to say that having a, having theatre in villages surrounding Exeter in places that are actually quite easy to reach, that's one of the one of the options. I don't know Ted, Ted, Ted Burn. I don't know so, so well, but presumably there's parking there. Yes, it's our very first time performing there. So we reached out to the team at Tedburn St Mary Village Hall. Um, because first of all the village hall is a lovely space to perform in and it's perfect for us but also because they've been very very warm and welcoming and Tedburn St Mary have a good local community culture around supporting the arts so we're hoping to build more connections and I think that's a good as you said it's a good direction to head in to actually take things outside of Exeter into smaller communities because we we are a community. Exeter isn't just isolated into itself. I think it's a very good opportunity to reach out and make some connections and see some places you might not see normally. Yeah, I think it's well worth continuing with it. So if there's if there's other productions going on, um, to let let us let us know because we could absolutely could c- connect with that. And the the other thing, I mean, we, we will come back to this between between now and, and the end of end of September, but the. The, the work that extra drama company is doing that is is radio or putting putting sound online that's that's not something you've been involved in very much so far is that is that right no but i have heard of it i think they they did very well in terms of people enjoying it and people tuning in they started it during lockdown recording some snippets of um plays and scripts and putting them into audio rather than uh, visual and I think it was it was really popular people really enjoyed it I haven't been involved in that at all I'm, I'm still very new to the company but I would very much uh, recommend having a little Google and checking it out because there are some really brilliant actors doing voice acting on them well I think what what I'll do is play some of those during September and that's that's a way of sampling or promoting the live performance which we're not going to reveal any more about <laughs> 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 you would simply have to go there. Yeah. Keeping our cards very close to our chest. I think that's the best way of doing it. I think it. so. I think so. So if you do if you do know the real Inspector Hound, don't tell anyone and try to forget. <laughs> well, well, tell people to go and see it at Exeter Drama Company, but don't tell anyone the story. That's that's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, th- thanks very much for coming in and explaining all of this to us well thank you for having me it's been really really lovely thank you no it's been been great